Well, we're ready to go. So I was talking to somebody recently, and we were talking about this class, and I said, well, you know, this next lecture coming up, this is really, this is really gonna be unusual. <laughs> this person said, Don, the whole thing is unusual. <laughs> and I thought, you know, you're right, that's true. And this will fit with that. We're gonna be looking at what is arguably one of the most difficult and puzzling passages of the New Testament that we have, which comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 to 16. There is great confusion over Paul's command here to have women wear a head covering while in worship. The question is, what did it mean for the original audience? And so that's what we're gonna look at. Uh, before I actually read the text, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to study your word. All of the words of the scripture are important. Even these ones that seem obscure and difficult for our understanding, there's meaning here for us. And so we pray, Father, for illumination as we work through this text tonight. We ask that the Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us. We pray that you would be honored and glorified, and we're delighted that we can just be assembled in a comfortable location to be able to study the Word of God. There are many around this globe that cannot do that at this time. So we recognize how blessed we are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you'll see it on the screen. Let's read it. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the women whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is in the image of the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for woman's sake, but woman for man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God." Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. So this is our text. Many scholars find Paul's reasoning here convoluted and confusing. Most evangelical commentators hold that there was a cultural protocol for women at Corinth, wearing head coverings, perhaps due to the practice of prostitution. That was what I first learned about maybe 40 or 50 years ago. I've heard it in other times uh, over these uh, decades. 
Uh, in this sense, it would be a little similar to Muslims of today. And yet some of the newest scholarship on this topic in doing research in looking into Corinth finds that that connection to prostitution and a covered head or uncovered head really doesn't hold as strong as it did years ago. Gordon Fee, uh, a scholar, in his commentary writes on this point, noting that it wasn't an issue regarding prostitution. He says, this is true and discounts the contention that uncovered women in Corinth were prostitutes. So the prostitution issue seems to be set aside now here are two non-evangelical comments regarding this. Victor Paul Furnish, there is no doubt that Paul also means to provide a theological basis for his instruction about the hairstyle of women who pray or prophesy. But in this case, his argument is obscure, at least to modern interpreters, and it may well have seemed unsatisfactory even to the Apostle Paul himself. Now again, this is someone who doesn't adhere to the authority of Scripture. Another one, Marion Swords, she writes, one hopes that the Corinthians had an easier time of following Paul's logic than do modern readers. Gospel Coalition, one of their uh, comments on this particular topic, a transcultural truth that undergirded Paul's, Paul's admonition, however, this does apply for us today. Women are different from men, and this distinction must be maintained. Continuing, it must be conceded that Paul's meaning in the specific case of Corinth is difficult to determine, but the main emphasis is that women should submit to men and that in some way angels, perhaps responsible for local churches, are offended or uh, uh, considered uh, this a sign of lack of subordination. That's generally where people come down on it, that, well, we don't know exactly what this means, but it obviously has something to do with male authority and women being submitted to it and men being under the authority of Christ. Pastor Jason Steele of this church had to deal with this text many, many months ago as he's working through Corinth, Corinthians, he said at one point in a sermon, he said, no one comes down on this subject the same, end quote. He's right. People are all over the map on this. Yet, there is another view, largely unknown, that accounts for the cultural context as well as rational, rationale for why this practice is not required today. The key is to determine Paul's argument from nature and why angels are mentioned as a concern. So as I was doing research for this course, I had to deal with this text and through a very roundabout way, I came across an article that was written by Dr. Troy W. Martin. Dr. Martin is a professor of religious studies at St. Xavier University. He wrote an article for the Journal for Biblical Literacy back in 2004. Now, I said to you at the beginning stages of this class, that a lot of the material that's covered in this class has been floating around in academia for years. But it's in theological journals, it's in scholarly works, it's in dissertations. It doesn't really kind of matriculate down to the masses of people that are in the pews. This is a great example for this. I mean, if I asked, I bet you no one here has ever heard of the Journal for Biblical Literacy. It's, it's, uh, it's abbreviated JBL. In any case, he wrote an article in 2004 dealing with this subject. In 2011, another professor, Mark Goodacre, he's at the Department of Religious Studies at Duke University, wrote a rebuttal to Martin. Then Martin responded several years later, <clears throat> that was in 2013, in which he argued against the rebuttal that came against him. And 
I've read all of those articles. I really felt that Martin did a great job, and I really didn't think that Goodacre did uh, that much damage to the contentions that he uh, were offering, was offering in his article anyway. In my notes, you will have those, those entries. If you want to read them, you can pull them up online. There, you, you can just get them if you just put them in there. Um, now, they are theological journal articles, so they're a little syrupy at times. You know, they might break into Greek here and there. They might do some of those kinds of things. But generally speaking, if you wanted to read it, you'd be able to get the gist of what was going on there. And uh, you're more than welcome to do that. I also found some corroborating evidence in Laurentine Stuckenbrock's uh, uh, article too. This was in the Stone Campbell Journal entitled, Why Should Women Cover Their Heads Because of Angels? So, what I'm gonna be doing tonight is presenting Dr. Martin's argument on this. This is kinda like, we talked about puzzle pieces and fitting together several times in this course as I've had time with you. And so we're gonna sort out the puzzle pieces here. We wanna examine the argument from nature. The whole thing of what's going on there, the crux of it, that's it. It's the argument from nature. Doesn't nature itself tell you that a woman should have her head covered? You see it on the screen, 1 Corinthians 11, 13, and 15. I read it, we're gonna do it again. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now I've heard, Again, all kinds of expositions on this, like why women should have long hair, why men's hair is typically shorter than even in the 60s when, when uh, women's hair was, was down to here, you know, guys' hairs was still long, you know, all those kinds of things come into play here. Martin's point is that in verse 13, and I have it underlined there. But uh, if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. This is a key word here in the text. It is the Greek term paraboleon, covering. This is the only Greek term translated as covering in the entire text of 1 Corinthians 11, 3 to 15. The other English occurrences of the word cover or covering, etc., are all translated from different Greek term. Paraboleion is routinely referred in lexicons as, quote, a robe or an article of clothing. So if you looked it up in a Greek dictionary, that's what you'd find. Martin maintains that paraboleion is the key word for understanding Paul's argument for nature. Again, robe or article of clothing is the, the dominant Semitic domain of the word. However, there's a broader use of it. Now, in still setting this up, I was going back to looking at my notes here of Dr. Richard Pratt, he's one of my professors I had at school. He was handling this text, and he made this point. You'll see it on the screen. This section begins with an unusual expression, judge for yourselves. By these words, Paul did not encourage the Corinthians to ignore his instructions. Rather, he meant that they should not blindly obey his directives. They were to think through the issue. Paul said this because he was convinced the believers in Corinth had the ability to think properly on this issue. He hoped they would reason through the issues with him and see how he came to his conclusions. In fact, since this was an area in which he knew the church was following his instructions, he probably expected the majority of his readers to agree with his position. He appealed to the Corinthians' own notions, knowing their worldview. He expected strong agreement with his position. I think we can all basically say we get that. All right, so the Corinthians understood. 
In clarifying the first century context, Martin begins his argument with two references to ancient playwrights. The first is Euripides. He uses the term parabolaion in one of his works. Now, let me give you the dates on him. He's 480 to 406 BC. So we're talking like 400 and some years before the time of Christ. He wrote 92 separate plays, of which 17 are tragedies, and one, a satire, has survived. The term, our term here, Parabolaion, ends up in one of his plays entitled Hercules Ferens. It was performed in 416 BC. Hold that thought. The second one shows up in another playwright by the name of Achilles Tacitus. He was from Alexandria and was a Roman era Greek writer of the second century AD. So we got a writer that's 400 years before Christ. Now we're 200 years later and another playwright is writing and this term comes up in his writing. It is in a novel that he wrote. It's a romance novel entitled The Adventures of Lippi and Clitophon. Here's the point. Both writers use the term parabolaion, Paul's term as it was found here in 1115 covering, to refer to male and female sexual organs. For Euripides, the term refers to testicles, while Achilles Tacitus uses the same term for male testicles and equates female hair as the male counterpart. Now, in our study, where we're headed tonight is this. We're going to do something you've heard a lot in the, in, in the media. We're going to follow the science. We're going to follow the science with several caveats. One, we're going to restrict it to biology. Number two, we're going to restrict that to human reproduction. Produ reproduction. And number three, the ancient world's understanding of it. Okay, so we're going to talk about some sensitive things tonight, but I think when we're done, you're going to see something that perhaps you've never seen before. Within the ancient medical field, female hair and male hair are the main sexual organs. Ancient medical scientific understanding of male and female reproduction, and let me give you some of these, you'll see it on the screen. Hippocrates, Hippocratic Oath, Greek physician considered as one of the most outstanding figures of history of medicine, his dates 450 to 370 BC. Numerous Hippocratic authors are cited from the same period of time. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, numerous citations. Tertullian was a church father. Everything you're going to hear from this point on, everything, is documented in first century or before sources. Not part of it, all of it. Every bit. Now, the following scholars attest to Martin's conclusion. I'm going to give you a list of those, too. Leslie Dean Jones writes Women's Bodies in Classical Greek Science. Uh, Philip J. Vander Eyck also wrote on the same topic. There's other writings here of Hippocratic writings. Dale Martin, The Corinthian Body. Uh, Paul Potter, Hippocrates, and R.G. Usher, Astophanes. These are all pretty heady kinds of work. If you look at the, where they're published, it's either uh, John, Hopkins, John Hopkins University, Oxford University, um, many of these uh, institutions, Yale. So, here we go. First, we're going to focus on male hair. Hair only grows on the head of pubescent humans 
because semen is stored in the brain. The channels of the body have not yet become large enough for reproductive fluid to travel throughout the entire body. At puberty, talking about men, secondary hair growth in the pubic area marks the moment of reproductive fluid from the brain to the rest of the body. Women have less hair because they have less semen. And their cooler bodies do not froth the semen. This comes up a lot in the writing, this frothing idea. I'll talk about it a little bit more. This is because their bodies are cooler and the ends of her hair reduce semen evaporation. Men have more body hair because they have more semen. And their hotter bodies froth the semen more easily throughout their entire bodies. The nature of man is to eject the semen so that during intercourse, semen has to fill the hollow hairs on its way from the brain to the genital area. So, to summarize this, so the, your, the, the reproductive fluid is in the brain. It's got to get from the brain to the genital area. And the way that happens is facilitated by the presence of hair. Typically, men have more hair on the face, chest, and stomach. The idea was that when, if men had hair on their back, it reverses the dynamic. In other words, when there's typical sexual intercourse between a man and a woman, it's chest to chest. Hair on the back was seen on a man as reversing the process and inhibited the flow of reproductive fluids. <coughs> a man with long hair retains much of his semen. Long hair draws the semen toward the head area, away from the general area, which is not what you want if you want to have a child. This is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, it is a shame for a man to have long hair since his nature is to eject the semen. What about women's hair? It is the nature of the woman to draw up the semen and congeal it into a fetus. This happens in the brain. The function of a woman's glands is similar to her hair. Glands absorb excess body fluid and her hair collects and frosts the fluid. In a sense, the woman is a large gland designed to absorb male reproductive fluid. Long hair assists the process by increasing the suction power of her hollow uterus. One ancient remar writer remarked, quote, long hair is not fit for males, but for, for, but for voluptuous women, end quote. Now this is interesting. There's actually a Hippocratic test for infertility. So if there was a concern that maybe this woman is infertile, what was the test? The test was that the doctor would insert a suppository in her uterus. She would come back the following day. If he could smell the scent of the suppository in her breath, he pronounced her as fertile. If he couldn't smell it, it was a concern that she was infertile. This was such a a belief that women who were involved in infidelity, okay, they're carrying on an affair, often ate garlic to mask their breath. We all know that a chill in the air often results in raised hair on the skin, and their understanding was that this inhibits the reproductive process. Hippocratic authors recommended that a woman neither bathe nor allow her hair to become wet after intercourse if she desires to retain a man's semen. The role of the woman's anatomy is to cool the hot semen and then congeal it into a fetus, which happens in the brain. There's also an issue here regarding hair removal. In the Greco-Roman world, women often removed 
pubic hair to enhance their attractiveness to males. It's pretty staggering when you think about some of those things. Plucking, singeing, caustic resins were used. But singeing, listen to this, singeing was considered the best to enhance fertility. Because remember, the semen of the man has to go up through the woman's body, and it happens through hair. If she has long hair, the tendency would be to go up that way. If there is a removal of hair on the lower part of her body, it facilitates the process. So depilation effectively removes the suction power of the pubic hair, and this facilitates the hair on the head to draw the semen upward to the brain where fertilization occurs. Pubescent girls were not required to wear a veil because their hair was not functioning genitalia. The church father, Tertullian, remarked, quote, let her whose lower parts are not bare have her upper likewise covered. He clearly understands that a young woman's hair functions as part of her genitalia. Now, what about men and their testicles? The testicular function as a counterpart to long feminine hair. Aristotle called the testicles weights which keep the channels taunt and not kinked. Their function is to facilitate the drawing of the semen toward, upward toward the brain in order to be uh, away from the brain to be ejaculated. The testicles also perform the final frothing in order to transmit heat for ejaculation. The female has no such weights, but instead develops a hollow uterus in drawing the male semen, up, semen upward and inward. Testicles within the man are connected to the brain by two channels in order to draw the semen from the brain to the outward parts of the body. Now, I know none of us have ever heard this before, and it sounds exceedingly bizarre, but you have to go back in time and understand, what was the ancient medical understanding of how fertility took place? This is what they believed. So here's Paul's argument from nature. Ancient physio physiology with the conception of hair is the premise for Paul's appeal to nature in 1 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. You see it on the screen here. He is contrasting women's long hair with testicles in men, appropriate to nature. A woman is not given external testicles, a parabolaeon, but instead long hair. Her hair is her glory because it enhances her female reproductive ability, which is to draw and retain semen for fertility. Since female hair is part of the female genitalia, Paul asks, judge for yourselves whether it's proper for a woman to display her genitalia when she's praying to God. In this regard, note the following, that priests in service to Yahweh receive special instructions regarding nakedness to not be visible while at the altar ministering before the Lord in this time of worship. Exodus chapter 20, verse 26. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. Again, while in the tent of meeting, the priests needed to wear linen breeches to cover their flesh. Flesh is often a euphemism for genitalia. You see it on the screen. Exodus 28, beginning at verse 42. You shall make for them linen breeches to cover their bare flesh. They shall reach from the loins even to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and his sons when they enter the tent of meeting or when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they do not incur guilt or die. It shall be a statute forever to him and to his descendants after him. The breeches were understood to be a glory and a beauty for the priests, while exposed genitalia was a cause of guilt and death. 
Exodus 28, verse 40, verse 43. And Aaron's son, you, sons, you shall make tunics. You shall also make sashes for them. You shall make caps for them for their glory and for their beauty. They shall be on Aaron and his sons when they enter the tent of the meeting and when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they do not incur guilt or die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. I want you to think about this for a minute. The high priests are wearing robes, right? No one see, can see anything there. But on top of wearing robes, they're instructed they have to have breeches. I guess the modern day equivalent, they, they have to be covered with underwear, right? God sees it. And they were instructed they want, God wanted everything covered. He can't, but he's instructed them this is part of the holiness code. Consequently, Paul intends women in service to God to cover their hair since it is part of the female genitalia. Both men and women may prophesy and worship, he'll cover that in 1 Corinthians 14, only when properly attired. Since we now know more informed reproductive physiology, there is no need for women to have their hair covered. All right, we'll pause there. We got a question. We need a mic, though. Sue. So. so if verse 13 says, is it proper for a wife to pray with her head uncovered, meaning what you just described, so covering her genitalia, but then verse 4 Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. So it's okay for a man genitalia to not be covered? Because, or, because. Or are we flopping from one meaning to another? Number, number one, because the male hair is not part of the genitalia on his head. In other words, you want, if you're a man, you want the semen to go to the bottom of your body. So when a man, when a, a young boy hits adolescence, they're growing facial hair, they're growing hair on their chest, they're growing hair on the pubic area to push things down. Foreign to us, but that was the understanding. And the actual opposite of it, if a female, you want less hair on the bottom part of your body and you want a lot of hair on the top of your body. Because this is where the brain area would be this, the bringing together of these seminal fluids to congeal a fetus. So basically what you're saying is the women's hair is considered more <coughs> of the reproductive organ and hence need to be covered at, at more than the men's head hair. It yes. Is not so much. Yes. Reproductive organ. Yes. And this is, and this is Paul, if you take, if you understand it this way, then when Paul says, judge for yourselves. I mean, would, would, do you want women going around this way? I mean, typically they were veiled or they were braided. Hair was braided. Um, and he's concerned about the worship service here. Who, somebody else had a question? Yeah. It has to do with the idea that in, in the temple worship, women were outside of the main part of the temple, right? Yes. And now we have men and women joined together in a worship act, which didn't happen in, typically in Jewish culture, correct? No, yes, that's so right. So that, it would be a new problem for Paul, is what I'm saying. Right. Because he had all these things about and, and, and later on, we're going to read in chapter 14 of uh, 1 Corinthians that women are prophesying, and they're not being rebuked for that. Prophesying is speaking the word of God. They are not rebuked for that. What they're rebuked for is if they're sitting in judgment over men. But there's nothing wrong with that. But he's concerned about the decorum of this. Paul's logic here in view of this data is not convoluted. First century philosophy and physiology demonstrate that Paul and the Corinthians comprehended quite well 
the argument from nature and why the veiling of women was necessary. It would make all the sense in the world if we're back in the first century. But what about angels? Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. This is the interface with a supernatural view of Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Okay, now, I remember being at a conference where R.C. Sproul was giving a lecture and he made a comment about the educational background of Paul. Paul was different than the other apostles. I mean, everybody else that came from Galilee, they were uneducated. There was no formal training there, right? Paul, what Sproul did was he made a comment in regards to the fact of not only the education that Paul had as a Pharisee, but then all of the additional study that he had after he became a believer he said, uh, and I'm, I'm quoting him at this point, he said he probably had the equivalent of three PhDs. Paul knew everything in depth of what we've been covering in this class. It was common in the first century. Well, we showed great pains to show that the, the Bible that they used was a Septuagint. The Septuagint is very much uh, understanding a general a um, uh, supernatural view of Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4. He knew that. And he knew that there had been times where there were divine sexual rebellions in the past. And I underline that the word rebellions. You've only heard about one so far. It happened more than once. And we will deal with that in the days ahead. He has that in the back of his mind, I believe. Added to this, this isn't Thessalonica. This isn't, you know, Ephesus. This is Corinth. Corinth is like the sex, sexual promiscuity ground zero in the ancient world. I mean, the key thing is the geography there. It, there was an isthmus. And so they figured out a way that they could get ships on, on uh, overland, drag them across to get them to the other side of the water, and they charged uh, these sailors for this fee. It made Corinth very wealthy. It was a great place of commerce, a lot of things going back and forth, a lot of guys with a lot of money. You also had at Corinth the temple for Aphrodite. Okay, sat on this Acropolis that looked over the city. Number of writings suggest that there were up to a thousand prostitutes that were associated with that temple. There was so much promiscuity in Corinth that the Romans coined a phrase, a term. It was to be Corinthianized. Now, if they referred to you that way, it was like saying, hey, you're a loose girl or you're a loose guy. You know, because that was just part of the, of the society. So this church is in the middle of all that. And sexual infidelity and sexual promiscuity had been a problem. And so Paul's got this, I think, on the back of his mind here. And third, the powers of darkness are on notice here that the church's women are indeed spoken for and submitted to their own husbands. They're spoken for. Paul's argument here is strange to our ears, but nonetheless exhibits his concern for proper sexual decorum and not allowing any possibility for lesser Elohim promiscuity. Now, do we have any other evidence of this in the early church? Yeah, we do. Look it on the screen. This is Tertullian, church father, 155 to 220. He writes, quote, If the woman ought to have power upon her head, he's talking about a covering, even more should the virgin. For it is particularly virgins who have need for such power upon the head, 
For on account of the angels refers to these angels that fell from God and heaven because of lust for females. And surely these angels did not lust after females whose bodies had already been defiled. That means they're no longer virgins. They did not lust after those women who were relics of someone else's human lust. Instead, isn't it more likely that they were inflamed for virgins whose blossom also is used as an excuse for human lust, end quote. What was the understanding? Tertullian had the same biological understanding of everything you just heard. Also note that pubescent young girls need not wear the power on their heads because they're immature and they are infer infertile. What about men and head coverings? Same chapter here. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is in the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. The reasons for no head coverings for males would be male short hair is not reproductive. Secondly, the covering of the head for males may have caused confusion over gender between the two sexes. And number three, that oftentimes when you're in the presence of somebody of great power, you take off your head, head covering, your hat, because you recognize you're in the company of a superior. Okay, Christ is the head of the man. And so consequently, he takes that off. Now, when I first came across this article, I thought, I've got to follow this up. So I have corresponded with Dr. Martin. He and I have had several back and forths with emails. And the first was maybe about nine months ago, and we were talking about this whole background of the ancient world and, and going through all of that. But in his article, Dr. Martin didn't deal with the angels. All he was dealing with was Paul's meaning of this word, this Greek word. So I wrote to him, and I said, what do you think about the angel connection? And this was his response to me. You'll see it on the screen. The answer to your, question, your second question is a hearty yes, most definitely. The sin of the angels in Genesis 6 is the most reasonable explanation for Paul's concern with women not covering their hair in a worship service when angels are likely in attendance. End quote. Okay? Now, I just blew you away. Okay. But I am convinced if you go home, you meditate on this, and then go back and read this passage, you tell me if you come up with a better explanation for what's actually going on there. This stands. This really does stand. I have been trying to get it in front of some people that I'd like to review it, and have been unsuccessful to this date. But nonetheless, this was actually written in a journal almost 20 years ago and is largely unknown. But there it is. It relates to our topic. It fits and it makes sense. It's odd, but you, when you think about the medical part of it, going back in time of how they looked at all of this with their understanding, it begins to make sense. Putting uh, Martin's agreement with your um, proposal there together with what Tertullian wrote about the veiling of virgins, even like uh, up to today, if you're thinking about why or if women should cover their heads in church today, um, really it would 
anybody, any woman who's not a virgin wouldn't need to because apparently only the virgins are the ones that are attractive to angels. Well, no, he doesn't. Paul doesn't qualify it. Tertullian gets into this later, later, but Paul doesn't qualify it. He's going on record of saying these women are spoken for by the men that they're submitted to. So I'm, I'm assuming those were adult women. Uh, Tertullian takes a different bent on it, which I can understand where he's coming from, too. Yes? Well, it's just also, so we now know that's not how reproduction works. Well, that's true. You know, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can all have our heads bare. Just a comment. We used to uh, know some Hasidic Jews in New York, and it was interesting that the younger women would not, would always have to have their hair long. The younger women, they'd have to have their hair. But then once a woman got married, she actually had to have her head shaved. They shaved her head, and then she would wear a wig over it. So all the Jewish married women in New York City wear, that are Hasidic wear wigs. Yeah, I, I actually I don't know all. the meaning behind that. Well, uh, it's could, interesting that it kind of correlates in some respects with what you're saying. It could, but I, you'd have to, I, I have not pursue that with any of uh, the, yeah, we have over here. I just wonder how this relates to the Muslims, that women are always um, required to wear the veil and the headpiece, and um, is that somehow tied to this, or? Uh, I, I don't know the history of that. <clears throat> I, it has something to do with modesty, that's for sure. Uh, that, there's no doubt about that, but I don't know if it's connected to this ancient understanding of reproduction or not. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Islam came into existence about 636, 636 something like that. Yeah. So you're looking at 600 years past biblical times. So I don't think, I think it is, it is a modesty thing for them. The men don't want the women being seen by other men, but I don't think it's tied into this. Amish, just their understanding that straightforward, like we understood it before you told us. Is that why the Amish have the little head? I can't answer that. Okay, I, I don't know. That. So the, the first, I mean, I've, I've actually read that original argument, both, both uh, peoples going back and forth. The thing that still intrigues me is for, with the angels. If the angels, because this is only required by Ooh. Paul in church during worship. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the argument is, okay, the angels in church have issues, but the, the demonic elements outside of church don't have issues. It could be that he's concerned that there not be another fall that's provoked by females. It could but, be but that. No, I mean, Ter Tertullian doesn't seem to imply that. He doesn't. But, and I haven't seen or read anything that does seem to imply that. So that's the question I have. It seems to be very exclusive to worship, which, again, I've seen no one argue, argue this, but it seems also that Paul's well, concern was coming out of a Gentile version of a long-standing Jewish tradition about modesty and worship for men. Right. But again, I think he's, you know, we got a church that's located in a highly sexualized culture, and he's concerned about the worship of the church being holy. <clears throat> and I, this was obviously a concern on his mind in the way they were conducting themselves. Um, I... The, the, the other arguments I even just touched on earlier, you know, some prostitution, connections, and some of these other things, I mean, people turn themselves inside out trying to figure that whole thing out and make that fit. And as I said, a lot of scholars are now jettisoning that. Um, but again, a lot of them don't know what I just went over with you. So a secondary question is this idea of... The, I've been, in, I've been in church cultures that have uh, head coverings as traditional. And actually in America, most women in America prior to, let's say, the 1900s were all wearing hats in church habitually. Uh, and so that, that seems to be more motivated by a sense of humility and order. I mean, this, this idea of having a covering over your head 
I, I, what I've heard on this, I heard two things. For were women that are covering their heads and their, and their husbands want their heads covered, when, particularly when they're in church. Two things I've understood on it. A, Paul talks about it here, laid it out for this particular church, and wanted a visible sign of the woman's submission to their, her own husband. B, well, we don't know what the angel connection is, but in lieu of the fact that we don't know, we're going to have our women covered, right. okay? Some of the thinking. Catherine. All right. I don't understand. It's in Scripture, too, about the angels. Are these good angels or fallen angels or bad, uh, bad angels? No, we've already, we talked about it. I, mean, I these, know, but I didn't understand it. I they're, they are fallen. Okay. They are right. fallen, <clears throat> and there's no going back. Uh, there's no help for them. Uh, the, this particular I group. Yeah. I just don't understand how they, you're, you're supposed to cover your hair when the angels are in attendance. Is that? Well, the, I, the angels would be in, these are good angels that are in attendance. But as we are studying in this class, there are junctures in history where there have been fallings of these lesser Elohim. And Paul here would be saying, we don't want to do anything that's going to provoke that. He's erring on the side of caution. Thank you. This is a question I've had for several weeks. If women have to cover their hair because angels fall for human women, how are us as human men supposed to keep our vitality I mean, if angels who are holy with God look at our women in lust, how can a man who is natural not look at a woman in lust? Yeah. 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 The, good, the good news on that front is Jesus died for us, but he didn't die for them. You know, I mean, when, you, when you're having your worst day, and you have fallen, and you're saying, God, I cannot believe I've fallen over this sin this many times, and here I am again. Every day is a good day because Jesus died for our sins. And here you've got an example where that can't be said of these lesser Elohim. So we're helpless. No. no. Well, we're, ho we're hopeful. <laughs> We're hopeful. Uh, on the breach is saying a couple of things here. When Bridget and I were reading on this stuff, um, the breaches were part of if the priests were going to ascend up steps, their legs could be exposed even though they had their longer gowns on, is what we had read was the reason for the breaches on there. The uh, Muslim things, I was listening to uh, this gentleman talking. And he said, the reason, he said, in the West, you guys see this as we are restricting women and women's rights. He said, we are trying to protect our women here by keeping them from being lusted after. Mm -hmm. In the West, you guys take more and more clothing off your women mm -hmm. and do it to make them more sexually desired, where we true. are clinging more to our traditional values in ways where we keep them covered and keep them less likely to be lusted after by other men, and that's the reason that we do it. And you view it as we are keeping women from being all that they can be. And that was the Muslims' reason for wearing the hijabs and, and the coverings with that. Uh, as far as the angels looking upon the women and us looking upon the women, I don't know a man that, uh, there's not a man that I know that hasn't looked at a woman in lust at one point or another. And you pray, you know, you pray, Lord, keep me from these things. These are just things that I think we, everybody goes through. Um, you know, we pray for those things. Keep me from the alcohol. Keep me from the lust, lust in, of my heart, you know. Well, we say it as a reminder in the Lord's Prayer. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. I mean, we, we, we've got this issue, but this is a nice segue. I mean, how, how are we going to apply this? Okay, so the, we're, we're making the point here. Yep. My, my only question is when we were talking about the book of Enoch, and I did some study into that, and I found out that one of the main reasons it didn't get canonized was because it talked about the unseen realm too much for 
the fathers that put the Bible together and decided which books ought to be in there. And I'm just asking, you buy well, any it, of that? Or? It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why Enoch is not in the canon. I mean, it, it is a book of judgment. There is no grace in the book of Enoch. I mean, uh, you know, again, as I said earlier, I'm not making any kind of a defense that, you know, somehow Enoch should be included in our scripture. Although there are parts of it that was recognized by the, the Jews and the early church as being a word of God, background information, support information uh, for the rest of the scripture, but not as a whole. Now, <clears throat> the word I want you to think about here is the term provocative. Provocative. We live in a highly sexualized generation. I mean, you can't even say it's just our culture in North America. It's gone global. We know that. We've got the internet. We have that whole issue that's going on. Our kids are inundated with this kind of thing. Um, and all the while, there is a concern of the Word of God regarding a decorum and care that we need to have with how we view our eyes, what our eyes look on, and how we present ourselves to people who have eyes on us. This is what we have got to teach to the masses here within the church as well as to our young people as they're growing up. So there's a role here for grandparents. There's a role here for parents we don't want to be provocative. So if we're talking about women, there are certain terms that we could say are proper. There's nothing wrong with. So if a comment is made like this, that you look pretty, or that is a lovely dress on you, or that is a beautiful hairstyle, there is nothing immoral about those kinds of comments. I don't see that as a problem being given to any female at all. On the other hand, if we said, you look alluring, that's a sensual look. You're hot. That's a sexy dress. I mean, these kinds of terms that are becoming commonplace in society for normal life are outside the bounds of the people of God. You know, one of the objectives for this class was that when we go through this material, we become more sensitized to temptation. And I've challenged you to be thinking about not just the temptation, but what's behind the temptation. When you see sensuality, unbridled lust on television or movies, or it's in the radio, what I want you to begin to get sensitized to, there, is, there are powers that are actually behind that. It's not just the evil that's present, it's what's behind it. <clears throat> behind the curtain that's orchestrating that. And I think that the more we have a developed sensitivity to this, just like the guy who was raised on the fields of Iowa, ends up enlisting in the army, goes out for four years, is in battlefields, and comes back home, and is highly sensitive to sounds or rustling. Because he's been in a war zone. It's the same way <clears throat> we're in a war. We're in a war with the flesh, you know, the world, and the powers of darkness. It's a three-front war. Most generals become apoplectic about a two-front war, not alone three. That's where we are. That's where the church has been. And Paul says in the book of Ephesians that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against principalities, against powers, world forces of darkness. 
I want you to start thinking about the word provocative and put a lens on that to see what is actually behind that. Because when we do that, I think it somehow it creates a, a check. Do I really want to watch that movie or do I want? Do I really want to do this or do I not? The heightened sense of the disgusting, ugly, ungodly powers that are behind the scenes that are fostering this. Remember, I said to you at week one, week two, somewhere in there, we are culpable for all of our decisions. When we sin, it's our fault. Okay? No one's going to be able to say, the devil made me do it. But the powers of darkness foment. They encourage. They fester. They know we have a weakness with our eyes. They know God's made us in a healthy way to be attracted to one another. That's normal. But they exploit it for ungodliness. I think that's the word of the Lord here. Paul is saying to the church here at Corinth, don't be provocative. Don't live that way. You don't realize what you might be unleashing. We're supposed to be different. And somehow we have got to communicate that to our young people who are being raised in a bathtub that they're soaking in of this within the culture. I really do. I think that is the word of the Lord. What is the application? How does this relate to me? This is it. This is how it relates. And we got to convey that to them. This next generation, this is where it's at. You know, being at, for them being able to carry that baton of faith on and the holiness not destroyed. When I do those workshops overseas on sexual purity and these, these conferences that we'll do, I, I try to make the point. The objective here is to destroy the holiness of the church. So we get together on a Sunday morning, you fill up the building and everybody's singing these songs and we're all feeling good about what we're doing and yet there's some inroad into somebody's life where you have this spiritual abscess of wickedness going on there. When we come together in the purpose of worship, if that wickedness is going unchecked, if it's not being a sense of repentance that's there, then you can be assured that the worship or the prayers that we're lifting up are not going past the ceiling of the building. The context here was worship. The context was worship. When you come together, there's got to be a difference, and I think this is, this is the way to apply what we're learning. Okay, any other comments? We got I, I have a Karen, question. Uh, okay, two. Um, I understand all that, and I totally agree, but um, so often I see people fall into legalism when they start noticing every single sin, and I especially have seen this with parents you know, setting up so many rules that no kid can ever follow. Uh, what would you say would be um, like a check and balances system not to fall into legalism, which would not be a good thing either? Well, it, you know, I understand what you're saying about legalism. Some people would say it's legalistic for you to have some kind of a, a, a monitoring system on your kid's phone. Right. You know? So um, I would say this. Given where we are right now, we're so far over on the other side of this. If you're going to err, you know, push it to the side. I'm, I'm less concerned about legalism than I am about the, the liberty of everything else that's going on here. There needs to be a balance, and kids need to get the point that they're going to fail. 
And that's why as adults, we need to talk about our failures with our kids so they get the idea it's grace-based and not my works-based. So you gotta get that as a part of it too. But the idea of being able to draw a line and say, you know, do you think that's a good choice for you to be listening to that music? Or wanting to go to this particular movie? Um, you know, these kinds of, or the, how about that, this clothing? Um, is that, you think that's really appropriate? You know, I used to talk, when my daughter, we used to talk about, um, I used to say, words to this effect, I'd say, you know, Lael, when, if it's this dress with those shoes and this particular, it's the package. And I think it needs to be toned down. And maybe one or part of those is okay, but when you put everything together, it's maybe conveying something that we really don't want to convey. You know, skin tight clothing, you know, all these kinds of things. I mean, I think the word provocateur, provocative, is something for us to take stock of about this. Okay, there was one more comment here by Karen. Well, my thought was that we have the advantage because we have uh, the, the Spirit of God living in us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So, and, and it, Jesus said, or Scripture says, we're being transformed into the likeness of Jesus as we're going through our life. So we're, we're being sanctified. And to me, is if I focus on the presence of God on a minute-by-minute -minute basis in my life and hearing the Spirit of God speak to me and filling myself with the thoughts of God by, you know, Scripture or however else, it's easier to resist because the Spirit of God then kind of works easier because I'm submitting. And we all have that available once we're born again. We have born of the Spirit, so that Spirit of God in us can cause us to say no to sin. It can. Like that has to be developed, I think. It, it has like to be a fostered. Relationship with yeah, it has, to be, it has to be fostered. And at the same time, I think what also has to be fostered, particularly with our kids, is the fact that <laughs> when we do sin, we have grace with God. So you can't, we don't, on one hand, you, we don't want to presume on it. Like, I can live any way I want to live because I know Jesus loves me. You know, that, that's a whole problem. And on the other end is what, you know, um, uh, Nadia is concerned about it. We get so legalistic, you know, you can't even turn left or right. Um, that, but I do think where we are right now, the church in this culture, at this juncture, it, it calls for radical, some radical living. You know, um, John Stott was my professor for the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, the portion in there where Jesus said, <clears throat> you know, if your right eye causes you to stumble, block it out. You know, if, you, if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut the thing off. Well, you know, there have been times in the history of the church, I mean, some people have taken that literally. I mean, uh, Origen had trouble with lust, so he had himself castrated. I mean, it was the Council of Orange, they, they banned that whole practice. And the point is, you could be castrated, and you still have problems with what you're looking at, and what you're thinking, see? So Stott's point was, it's more about cultural amputation. We're not real good at denying ourselves anything. You know? It might need that adults, as well as conveying it to kids, learn a little more about cultural amputation because of the quest for godliness in an ungodly age. I mean, these are the days that we're living in. You've got you to see yourselves as strategically placed grains of salt at this age, at this time period. This, the lights are going out. I mean, there could be a revival, but right now, we're not seeing it in mass. There might be pockets here and there, but it's not in mass. 
And so we are the generation that has got to pass that baton of a bright light on to the next one and teaching them how to live when they are really going to feel like they're out of step with everything that's going on. Okay? I think that Paul's remarks here to this church located at Corinth of all places, you know, they were out of step if they're going to hear what he was saying because it was so licentious. All right, here's where we're going. <clears throat> so when we get back together after the first of the year, we're going to be delving into the product, <coughs> the product of the unions between lesser Elohim that fell with humanity that resulted in the Nephilim. We're going to deal with them. We got to deal with how did Nephilim show up again after the flood? We got to deal with the people groups of Canaan when the Israelites are called to go in and examine why was it that Moses said on certain people groups, you were to leave nothing that breathes, while others he left alone? That's what's coming. See you on the 8th of January.